Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and welcome to Master Leadership. Great leaders ask great questions, and this podcast takes you on a journey to master leadership with questions that matter to leaders who matter with your host, Lily Sinabria. Hi, this is Lily, and today we have the honor of speaking with Dr. Sunny Magana. Sunny is an award-winning educational futurist, best-selling author, and pioneering educational technology researcher. Sunny is a highly sought-after leadership consultant, speaker, and instructional coach with more than 30 years' experience helping educational systems around the world realize the power of transcendent learning. The author of numerous research studies and articles, Sunny's newest book, Disruptive Classroom Technologies, a framework for innovation in education, has been called brilliant, visionary, and revolutionary by some of the leading educational thinkers of our time. A tireless advocate for transcending the status quo, Sonny founded and served as principal of Washington State's first cyber school in 1996 a groundbreaking blended learning program that continues to meet the needs of at-risk students in Washington. He is a recipient of the prestigious Milken Family Foundation National Educator Award and the Governor's Commendation for Educational Excellence. An avid musician, yoga practitioner, and beekeeper, Sonny holds a Bachelor's of Science degree from Stockton University, a Master of Education degree from City University, where he was honored with the Presidential Award for Meritorious Scholarship, an Educational Administration Endorsement, and a Doctorate in Educational Leadership from Seattle University. Welcome, Dr. Sonny Magana. How are you? I'm very well, Lily. Thank you very much for asking. How are you? I'm doing well and so happy to have you on our podcast. As you know, this podcast takes us on a journey to master leadership. So are you ready to pour into our listeners? I am indeed excited and happy to share. So can you tell us a bit about your path to leadership and what you're doing now? Happily, I really came into leadership based on an innate curiosity I had about the role that technology could play in unleashing students' learning potential. Um, And I started researching the impact of technology on student learning in 1983. So I've been doing this for a long time. Um, One of the the old dogs in uh, (laughs) educational technology research. And I fundamentally found that when used well, technology unleashes students' innate leadership capacity. Now, that's a really interesting idea to, yeah. when we think about students as leaders, but they are. We need to absolutely embrace a kind of emergent leadership philosophy and draw out the leadership capacity, the learning leadership, the community leadership, the social justice action leadership that exists in each child that we serve in schools. And that just took me on a joyful path, working to unleash larger and larger amounts of leadership from a greater and greater numbers of populations. First as a classroom teacher, then as a building principal, then as a district leader, then I led several state initiatives, and I've continued my scholarship on leadership and also the practice of leadership with the express intent of building an emergence of leadership and not building dependence on me as a leader. I'm a researcher and an author and a consultant. I have my own consulting organization called Magania Education, and I engage in scholarship and research on the nexus of technology and student achievement and building leadership capacity so that the new and upcoming generations of school building and district educational leadership is immersed in what I call transcendent leadership. You know, you're speaking the words that really activate my heart. (laughs) Right off the bat, you're talking about someone who's curious. And I know that that's a wonderful characteristic for a leader to have. You spoke about unleashing student potential, unleashing leadership capacity, emergent leadership, all wonderful words to describe what we are doing. We're collaborating to really help 
all of us collectively master leadership. So I thank you so much for just being a part of this. So, Sunny, how would you describe your leadership style? And my leadership style is informal, <laughs> mm-hmm. but it's also focused on building capacity. So, you know, my name is Sonny. That's actually not my actual name. Very few people know my actual name. My real name is Anthony Joseph Magania III. And that sounds very formal. And whenever I heard somebody refer to me as Anthony, it's usually because I was in trouble. You know? <laughs> yeah. So for the longest time, I've just been a very kind of informal, very relaxed person as a student and as a leader. So my leadership style is very welcoming. That's probably a better way to describe it than informal. I'm very welcoming. I welcome people into my world. I welcome them to invite me into their worlds, into their perceptions of the role that leadership plays, the expertise that they're trying to build. And again, I'm going to put this in the context of teaching and learning because that's the paradigm. That's the soup in which I swim in education. So I think everyone has something of value to contribute to an organization. So in my leadership style, I welcome everyone in the organization to have contribution to the overall functioning of the organization. I'm not a hierarchical leader, although there are some times when in my leadership experience, some decisions need to be made, but I tended to be more fluid in my leadership. And let me explain what I mean by that. When it came time to identify the best way forward when we, as an organization, as our school, encountered a problem or an issue or some situation that had a constraint, I flattened the pyramid. So that was more like a web. And I ascertained knowledge and contribution and ideas from everyone, from the custodians, the school secretaries, clearly the teachers, parents, students, everyone that was involved were able to contribute to a greater understanding of the problem or the constraint that we had. But when it came time to execute, that's when we had more of an organizational process where everyone had a certain role, everyone had certain duties and delegations. And that mixture of kind of a web-based leadership experience to Mm -hmm. figure out which is the best way forward and then have a more structured approach in actual implementation of ideas has worked really well for me. So I think fluid is probably the best way to describe my leadership style based on the needs and the constraints uh, that we were experiencing at the time. So you occur to me as someone who sees value in people and you add value to people. That's important to you, right? I couldn't have said it better. People have inestimable value. Hmm. The, The value for every human is inestimable. And I'm really curious to learn about people. I'm curious to learn about the connectedness that we all share in this world. And that's enriched my life in getting to know my students, first of all, because my first leadership experience was a classroom teacher. As a classroom teacher, you are a leader. And I think I'm I, glad I, you said that, Sonny, because quite often teachers don't see themselves as leaders. And I happen to think they are probably the most important leaders in the building. I could not agree more. I think teachers are the most important leaders in the building because what they do on a daily basis, you know, that which transpires between teachers and students, students and other students in the classroom, and students in themselves, that is the most important interactions in any learning environment. I was just explaining to a friend of mine that my background is in science, so I'm fundamentally trained as a scientist. So you um, have a beautiful mind too. Beautiful mind and beautiful oh, okay. heart. This is great. I love it. <laughs> Well, thank you for saying that. That's very gracious of you. My first forays into science were as an environmental scientist. I was a systems biologist and studied whole ecosystems and the interactions between different species living in ecosystems. And I have to say, one learns so much by observing the natural world. And I learned so much about the interactions of different species and abiotic and biotic factors, the non-living and living elements in any ecosystem as a system, as a whole system that is in a way kind of perfect. You know, there's energy moves in, energy moves out. There's life, there's death. The death is really a part of the life. You know, uh, there's nutrients, there's producers and consumers. That really shaped how I viewed organizations, that every person in an organization is an essential part of that organization. So when I became a teacher, because I wasn't a teacher at first, I was a systems biologist, that was my career. And then I went into education and realized that my classroom was like a little ecosystem. <laughs> you know? wow. And every living creature in that ecosystem was 
of inestimable value, so much importance was brought to bear in the classroom. And I saw myself as the instructional leader of the group. And that just continued on my career as I became a principal. I won some awards for my uh, leadership and just continued on getting larger and larger platforms from which to share you know, my vision of emergent leadership. Well, that's a very unique perspective to be able to see things as a biologist, as a scientist, and to see how beautiful and essential everything is. And even when I was a building principal and work that I'm doing now, I'm engaged in whole organizational development where I'm taking entire organizations and helping them move forward. Every member of that organization is essential. And it's essential that we have a common vision that is built together. It's not my vision that I'm foisting on the organization, Mm -hmm. but rather a common vision for what highly desirable teaching and learning looks like. And then together we're moving forward. And my focus is on building capacity, Mm -hmm. not dependency. I'm writing this down, building <laughs> So you're thinking also of legacy and longevity. You know, that's a really good way to put it, Lily. I appreciate you asking that about legacy. I'm not as interested in my own legacy. It just doesn't feel good even saying those words. What I'm interested in is continuing the work that I've begun. The research that I've been engaged in for the past 35 years has uncovered a really remarkable way that we can reliably increase student achievement. The strategies and framework that I've developed have an effect size of 1.6, which was using Professor John Hattie's effect size scale. Let me put that into developed terms. <laughs> yes, <One>. thanks. <laughs> yeah. An effect size of 1.6 is equivalent to four additional years of learning in a single year. Mm-hmm. It's a quadrupling wow. of academic achievement. So I work with Robert Marzano. Uh, he was the author of my first book and a research partner. Professor John Hattie is another research partner, and they've all corroborated these findings. 1.6 effect size is huge. And using technologies, readily available digital technologies, in the ways that I've described in my book, Disruptive Classroom Technologies, and in my framework for innovation, the T3 framework, really unleashes student leadership potential. It's really what it is. It's not an instructional model. It's not a technological model. It is an innovation model. But really what underpins it all is student leadership, emerging student leadership. When students become leaders of their own learning, they can't help but become leaders of learning for others. I love that. Now let's talk a little bit yeah. about Maganya education. If our listeners wanted to connect with you and bring you on as a consultant or someone who could work and partner with their schools, how could they do that? Yeah, my website is sort of the portal for all things that I've developed on my research, writing books, and it's maganiaeducation.com, M-A-G-A-N-A, education.com. So I've written a number of books, a number of research studies. I blog readily, and I'm just about to publish a research article on Oxford University Press, which is a tremendous honor. Oxford University commissioned me to write a research article on my 35 years of exploring the impact of technology and education. So I'll have links to my studies for citation. So that's how folks can get a hold of me if they're interested in doubling academic achievement. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, I love the title of your book, you. Disruptive Classroom Technologies, a Framework for Innovation in Education. And where could they purchase this book? It was published by Corwin Press. So uh, it's available on the Corwin website. It's also available on Amazon. It's become a bestseller. Folks are recognizing that this pathway forward that I've described is real. It's credible. And in the words of John Hattie, who said, Sonny's T3 challenge is how we'll see technology make the difference we've all been after. And I'm really gratified that so many people are embracing this vision that I have and adding to it, adding their artistry to the vision of unleashing limitless student learning potential. And I want to get back to the question about legacy that you so graciously mentioned, because, you know, I do have some vision. I know that I can see down the track a little bit. My gaze is clearly focused on the horizon. And I wrote this book because I wanted to disrupt the epidemic of very low impact technology use in our schools. 
But the reason that I can see further down the track is because I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. I'm standing on the shoulders of John Dewey and Paulo Freire and John Bransford and Linda Darling Hammond and Robert Marzano and John Hattie and all these incredible educators who've given us so many gifts, Michael Fullan, Yang Zhao. I'm building upon their work, an apt metaphor, because I'm standing on their shoulders. My hope is not that I get accolades or any kind of adulation for standing on other people's work. I want someone else to stand on my shoulders. I want other people to take the work that I've continued because it is a continuation and build upon it. And that to me is a legacy worth embracing, continuing the work on reliably enhancing academic achievement with technology and unleashing students' leadership to make the world a better place so that others can follow. I'm passing the baton. Mm -hmm. To me, that's a legacy worth leaving. Yeah, certainly a beautiful, disruptive, collaborative, just wonderful legacy. This is beautiful. So thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. Now, Sunny, which quote or quotes about leadership speak to you and why? Yeah, that's a great question. There are so many. One that comes right to the forefront uh, was by Samuel Beckett, who is the great Irish poet playwright. And he wrote about the human experience, you know, the human condition. And I think this is a leadership statement. Here's his quote, and he's just so eloquent. Um, He says in just a few syllables what's taken me a lifetime (laughs) to comprehend, and it's this. Have you ever tried? Have you ever failed? No matter. Try again. Fail again. Fail better. Hmm. Fail better. And that, to me, is what leaders need to embrace is the notion that we're all frail, we're all fragile humans, that we're all connected, and that learning is the end result of failure. When we fail at something, when we make a mistake, when we err, and dwell upon that error, dwell upon that mistake that we make, not to beat ourselves up, not to you know, castigate ourselves or punish ourselves, but to use that as a catalyst to move forward. To me, that's the essential role of leaders, is to provide conditions for everyone in the organization to fail better. If you show me a school where teachers are learning, I'll show you a school where students are learning. Fail better. As you're talking about that, I'm thinking of an organization that isn't afraid to take risks. Yeah. And in fact, there's another quote from um, the great psychologist. It was actually, he was a professor of home economics. Kurt Lewin is considered by many the father of action research. And he said, no action without research and no research without action. And to me, there's almost a Zen-like quality to that statement. No research without action and no action without research. Because in our world in education, we need to base our decisions on evidence, on the preponderance of evidence for whatever it is that we want to do. It's a teacher evaluation, classroom interactions, curricula, assessment. You know, we need to follow what the research says, what's the highest quality research available, and what direction does that provide. When we apply our decisions, when we apply our leadership practices, we need to be able to evaluate the impact and measure the impact of our decisions and our actions. And that sort of completes the action research cycle. Thank you so much. Now, Sunny, what type of leader are you inspired by and why? Yeah, great question. I'm inspired by leaders that recognize the power of emergence, that their role isn't to build dependency on the leader. See, there are a lot of leaders that have what I consider an immature or as yet undeveloped sense of leadership as a process of holding power. In fact, power mongering is that kind of leadership. And transactional leaders are leaders who hold on to power and they trade access to power for goods and services and resources that benefit the leader, privileges the leader. Those aren't leaders worth listening to, frankly. Leaders that hold on to power, that are power mongers, don't move me. Transformational leaders move me. Transformational leaders are leaders who recognize that the relationship between the person who is in the leadership position and everyone else is what's important, the relationship. Mm -hmm. So leaders that are transformational recognize the power of the collective and the importance of followership to a leadership experience. And those are the kinds of leaders that move me. But I have to say I'm moved most by what I call transcendent leaders. And these are leaders that have a clear vision for moving above and beyond 
the boundaries of what we know, the limitations and expectations that we run up against on a regular basis. Those are leaders that really inspire me. President Barack Obama was a leader who inspired me. He was a transcendent leader, I think, because he had a vision for our country that was glorious. Martin Luther King was a leader who represented transcendence, rising above and beyond the constraints of the human condition and envisioning a better place where everyone benefits from the movement towards a more desirable future. Those are the kinds of leaders that really inspire me. Absolutely. Now, when you look at education and how we prepare leaders, does it lean more towards the transactional leader or the transcendent leader? Great question. I think that what I've seen is a focus on transactional leadership, which I'd say in some ways, you know, transactional leadership can really be described as sort of management, you know, right. managing resources, managing people, managing situations, putting out fires. That's an essential part of the role of a leader is to manage. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm separating that from power mongering because that's in a different category. But in transactional leadership realm, that's where we have to manage our resources, manage, evaluate uh, teachers, evaluate or manage our classrooms or schools. That's necessary, but it's insufficient. We need to expand our philosophy of leadership to include vision setting, establishing a collective vision for what the best school could be. If our school is where it is now, how can we improve? What's the vision for improving the school system so it could be the best that it can be? And then developing a common language for moving forward and evaluating progress. That's what I think needs to be expanded in our colleges of education and leadership schools to provide more transformational leadership practice in theory and in the extant literature around transformational leadership. I absolutely agree. You know, I was trained to be a transactional leader and I saw how ineffective some of that could be. And I had to do a lot of research on leadership and a lot of work on myself one of some things that we can start to do to move towards being a transcendent leader? Yeah, that's a great question. I think scholarship is the first step, is doing what you did in your leadership experience. You found it was insufficient. So you went out and engaged in your own scholarship to find examples of pathways and ideas for becoming a more transcendent leader. And there is quite a lot of research, actually. There's quite a lot of literature on transformational leadership. I point to Margaret Wheatley and her wonderful book, Leadership in the New Science. That was a pivot for me. When I read her book, Leadership in the New Science, it opened up my eyes to the possibilities of transcendent leadership and taking the whole system beyond the constraints that we may find ourselves in any given situation. There's a wonderful book called Reframing Organizations by Bowman and Deal. Yes. And that is a classic tool for reframing how we think about our organization. But then I would go on to say Fairhurst wrote a book on the power of frame, on conceptual frameworks. And I think that should be essential reading for leaders to frame situations in such a way that invite movement forward. It invites the individuals in your organization to move forward willingly with authentic engagement. So those types of resources are essential. I think Robert Greenleaf and the Power of Fellowship is an excellent example for transcendent leadership and how you know, the leader focuses on the power of followership and servant mm. leadership. So these are all wonderful tomes that we can learn from and then take that research, take what works, take what we know about leadership from the research literature and then artfully apply that science in your classrooms, in your schools. The leadership is an art and a science. So what is the portrait of your learning organization that you want to have painted? What does it look like? What does the highest possible functioning in your school or your organization look like? And how can you invite everyone in the organization to paint that portrait collectively? Hmm, I love that. And I think part of the art is listening to podcasts mm -hmm. like this, listening to guests mm. like yourself, mm. respond to these important questions that we're asking about leadership. So thank you so much for that. Hey, leaders, stay tuned for the rest of the interview following this brief message. Speaking of disruptive classroom technologies, Master Leadership at Schools podcast program does just that. It is created to ignite and unleash students' innate leadership capacity and create a community of leadership learners. So go to masterleadership.org forward slash MLS 
and see it in action. That's masterleadership.org forward slash MLS. Now, Sonny, what's the best advice you've ever received? The best advice I've received was to maintain your equanimity <laughs> you know, and engage in restorative practices. That's probably the best advice that I could share with other leaders is leadership is a very draining process. It drains us physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, because you should be giving. I mean, if you're doing it right, you should be exhausted. Right. Um, so engage in restorative practices. Find out what recharges your batteries, whether it's meditation or exercise or music or quiet time. Be mindful of your own limitations, your own boundaries, and engage in the practices that restore your joy, your sense of being, your sense of yourself, and do that daily. Give yourself five minutes, five minutes every day to engage in mindfulness practices. And that was some advice that was given to me 45 years ago. And I've been engaged in mindfulness practices ever since. And you do um, yoga That's probably well, right? the best. I do. Yeah, I'm a yoga practitioner and spend quiet time every day. And it just recharges my batteries. Yeah. Oh, no. That's so important because yeah. we can go and go and go and forget to eat. Mm -hmm forget to exercise, forget to restore ourselves yeah. and crash and burn. And so I do see this yeah. happening. And so I appreciate that. Now, Sunny, you know, in education, we have teams, we inherit teams. Mm -hmm. To you, what does it mean to have a good team and how do you build and sustain one? Yeah, another great question. I think the way a team is built is by recognizing the different yet complementary contributions of each member of the team, whether it's a team of students or a team of teachers or a team of principals, recognize the inestimable value of every human in your team, but also know that everyone can contribute something and they want to contribute. You know, I have practices in my consultancy. I work with leaders to find out what those gifts are, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. find out what those unique valuable contributions that each member of the organization can bring. Because another work that has uh, really informed my thinking is the work of Rudolf Dreikers. He wrote a book called Children, the Challenge. And he made such insightful comments about humans and working together in groups. He said that every human has a deep-seated, innate desire to be a valued mm -hmm. and contributing member of the group. Yes. A valued, contributing member of the group. So as a leader, how can you ensure that every member of the organization feels that they are a valued contributing member. And even though their contribution may look different, it may be unusual, find the complementary nature of that contribution and value it and do so with gratitude and love. And it takes someone that's intentional, like you have to intentionally look out for that daily, right? Yeah. So to be a leader in education, it's a great responsibility. So what do you do on a daily basis to set your mind? You know, I do a number of things. I mean, I mentioned the restorative practices mm -hmm. in the mindfulness practice. I do that every morning. As soon as I wake up, I engage in some mindfulness. Here's the real gift of mindfulness is it gives us the gift of presence. Mm -hmm. Presence is probably the greatest present we can give to others by being very present in the moment and being there for one another. That is so significant. It's so significant. So I engage in my mindfulness practices in order for me to be present and to experience the joy and the magic that happens when I interact with other people or interact with other things, when I'm writing, when I'm researching. When I'm present and in a state of relaxed alertness is when I do my best work. Mm. And as a leader, I encourage and foster an environment that's conducive to other people finding out how they engage in their best work? What are the practices for them that help them be really present so that their performance is optimized? Wonderful. Now we're going to shift gears here a little bit. Can you tell us about a challenge that you've experienced and how it's shaped your life? Sure. It's interesting. Um, I was just thinking about this the other day. I live in Washington State and we have a lot of beautiful mountains here. And so I've been here for 28 years I started engaging in mountaineering and I enrolled in a group called the Mountaineers. I'd done a fair amount of rock climbing and mountaineering and scaling big peaks, but I wanted to take this course that would allow me to get a certification in this mountaineering group. 
So I was already fairly skilled as a rock climber and a root finder and being able to assess the conditions and the snow. I just was fascinated by it all and, and just really embraced it all. And this is going to sound odd. It's not going to sound like a leadership experience, but it actually was. Mm -hmm. uh, I went with a group where I played a role and my role was the student. Even though I had more skill than the leader in charge of this expedition, we were climbing a rock peak called Guy Peak, which is a pretty famous peak here in Washington State. Most people that go on to climb Mount Everest do a warm-up on Guy Peak. It's an arduous peak, not nearly as high as Mount Everest, but conditions are such that climbing that in the winter is sort of a precursor to climbing Everest. Mm -hmm. So we're on this peak, and I took a back seat. I was playing the role of the follower, even though the leader was making some bad decisions regarding how we were climbing the mountain, we got off route, it started to rain, and then darkness started to descend. And as we were climbing, I was on a rappel, which is where you're hanging from a rope, rappelling down from uh, the summit, and I got hit with some rock fall, mm. uh, which is a dangerous thing to happen. So a bunch of rocks fell from up above us, and I got hit in the head, in the face, actually, with a boulder um, that just split my face open. And so I was bleeding profusely while I was hanging from <laughs> the rope. Wow. And, you know, all my life, you know, the blood was flowing out of me. And oh at that God. moment, something just turned. And I switched that situation. And I immediately started acting as a leader. I said, okay. Here's what we're going to do. I've got to stop the blood flow. I've got to get off the rappel. We've got to find a route. Then I started telling everybody else what to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I, my leadership just sort of enacted because it, this now became a rescue. This oh, no crisis, right. Oh. It was now a rescue. And I was the victim. So mm -hmm. what was really interesting to me is even though I was losing blood, I still had the presence of mind to engage in some mindfulness practices, slow my breathing, slow my heart rate, slow my blood flow to try to stem the flow of blood. And then I was the leader and was telling everyone how to do and led us all off the mountain. Safely. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah. Safely. Yeah. Summiting is optional. Returning from the mountain is mandatory. I was young. I was in my early 30s. I realized that I had leadership potential and could do so in a way that was effective. Mm -hmm. And that was a really powerful moment for me because my role changed from sort of a passive, hey, let's wait for somebody to tell me what to do and I'll do it, to a more proactive, self-reliant, but inclusive leader. Wow. That's an intense experience. Yeah. So I've got the scar to prove it. I, you know, oh my goodness. <laughs> Thank goodness you were able to come out of that safely. You know, there are times that as leaders, we do need to take a back seat or we should, because we need to be good followers as well, but then to know when to step up. And sometimes it means taking the wheel when we see a hazard ahead of us and have the presence of mind to guide the organization safely. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Sure. Now, can you tell us about one of your greatest successes? Yeah, I was a teacher at an alternative school here in Washington, and I realized that we had a terrible problem that wasn't being addressed and that was that a large percentage of seniors were dropping out of high school in the second semester of their senior year, too large a percentage. And I wondered about that, like why were there no safety nets? Were there no options for these students and that they didn't realize that they weren't going to graduate? What was underneath this problem? And I found that in the particular school system, it was called the Muckleteo School District, if a child failed two courses in their freshman year, two semester courses, there was just no way for them to recover those credits to be able to graduate on time. There was no options, there were no recovery practices, there were no credit recovery or programs for them. And these kids went on their academic career until months before graduation when the realization finally hit them that they weren't going to graduate and then they dropped out. Hmm. and didn't finish the high school diploma at all. And that was terrible to me. So yes. I worked with a group of very wonderful educators to develop a vision for a credit recovery program that we called the Cyber School. And this was in 1996, yes, where we wanted, to, yeah, we wanted to have a program that allowed students to realize their potential, but using technologies to bridge the gap. Because this is the time when personal computers had been around for about 10 or 12 years. These kids had an interest in computers, and it seemed like a hook to get them reconnected and completing their coursework. So I pitched the school board to have a school that was open at night. We used the existing facility of the alternative school 
And instead of closing it down at three o'clock in the afternoon, I said, let's keep it open until nine and we'll have juniors and seniors come to this night school program. We'll get them jobs during the day so that they can earn some credit through vocational education, get some self-esteem, get some money in their pocket, get some responsibility, feel good about themselves, and then come to night school. Mm -hmm. And that was the cyber school program, the Washington Cyber School, which right off the bat, we did a research project. A a friend of mine was getting her doctorate. So we studied the impact of the cyber school program. 89% of the students that enrolled in the cyber school program were successful in the first year. Wow. 89%. And these were kids that were not going to graduate on time. 89% of them were successful the first year and graduated with their class. The remaining 11% re-enrolled the following year. And I'm very happy to say that the cyber school is still in existence. That was a great success. And, so it's still uh, in existence. Yeah, it's still uh, serving the needs of at-risk students in Washington State. In ACES Alternative High School, the night school program is still serving these kids and serving the community. And it's a great example of what can happen when a group of people that are committed put their minds together to serve the needs of students. And there you go, building capacity, the legacy, all the things that you talked about. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Now, many leaders describe themselves as lifelong learners, and I know that you are one. But what does that mean to you? And what are you learning now? Yeah, again, great question, phrased very well. You know, I think learning happens when we step out of our comfort zones. Hmm. When we do something that's discomforting, that we're not good at, and we don't like not being good at things as humans. We like to have a sense of mastery. So we tend to continue to do the same things. I've always been interested in learning. I have to say, it's been a big part of me ever since I can remember. So I'm constantly challenging myself to try new things and to learn new things. Hmm. I'll give you an example. When I was in my mid-40s, I told my wife, honey, I think I want to have a midlife crisis. <laughs> <laughs> You're so calculated. I know. I, guess. <laughs> I want to have a midlife crisis. But I wanted to do it on my own terms. I want to control the midlife crisis. And she said, what are you telling me? I said, I'm not going to buy a sports car. I really want to do something totally different. I want to learn how to surf. She said, you're 45 years old. Why do you want to learn how to surf? I said, I just do. I want to try something that I've always wanted to do. So sure enough, I went and researched it and uh, took some courses. I went out with some guides and I learned so much about how I learn by learning how to surf. And so now I'm surfing never enough. I'm surfing regularly. I just love it. And it's just added another layer of richness to my life and, and adds so much joy. I never feel more alive and when I'm in the water, in the ocean, catching waves. I mean, it's hard. You know, surfing is one of the most difficult things I've ever tried to do because it's exhausting. And when you're not good, you, you waste a lot of energy and you splash around. But if you stick with it, you have to you know, have that grit. And so I think when we step outside of our comfort zones and try things that are totally outside of anything we've ever done before, we learn something about ourselves. We discover something about ourselves that we didn't know otherwise. And as a result, we have a greater sense of self-awareness. And what's one thing that you discovered about how you learn? I am an immersive learner. I need to immerse myself in a process and I need to have a pathway that has a beginning, a middle and an end. It's almost like the hero's journey. You know, there's an entry point. Then there's a point where things get really difficult and things get really challenging. And then there's that sort of ending point where I start to achieve some level of success or mastery. I'm also a musician. I play different instruments. And so I'm teaching myself how to play drums, for example. I've never played drums before. I've always been a guitarist and singer and played little keyboards. Teaching myself to play drums also gave me a sense of how I learn best, which is I need to visualize, I need to practice part and the whole simultaneously, I need to establish a routine, I need to have a strategy in place for me to learn, and I need to be able to evaluate impact the entire way I'm learning something. So you just learn how you learn best when you learn new, challenging, and interesting things. And I really just encourage everybody to go out and try something new. It doesn't have to be surfing. It doesn't have to be music. It could be art. It could be knitting. It could be crochet. It could be gardening. Beekeeping. I started keeping bees. What? Yeah, I know. I should have used that example first because it's the most incredible thing I've ever done. (laughs) Tell me what led you to that. Well, uh, in researching my book, Disruptive Classroom Technologies, I have this framework. It's called the T3 framework, and it stands for the three domains of technology use in the final translational, transformational, and transcendent. 
Mm. And in the transcendent technology use, uh, there are two elements, inquiry design and social entrepreneurship. I think it's important for kids to engage in their own inquiry design and explore wicked problems that matter to them in order to make the world a better place. I think that's the highest order use of technology in education. And when I was researching examples of kids that were using technologies to identify, investigate, and hypothesize solutions to authentic, real world, wicked problems that matter to them, I came across a young woman named Malila Ulmer who started a company called Me and the Bees. And when she was a young girl, she was stung by a bee and it scared her and she didn't know what to do. But then she started to learn about bees and started to become fascinated by bees and started keeping bees as a young girl. And then she created a company called Me and the Bees Lemonade, which uses locally sourced honey from Texas. And I think she was on the Shark Tank show and I think she was on Oprah. So now her lemonade is available at Whole Foods. Malila Omer is a social entrepreneur. And the reason why she's a social entrepreneur is that the problem that mattered to her was she learned about colony collapse disorder. Colony collapse disorder is a wicked existential problem that faces us all. We lose close to 50% of our bee colonies every year due to pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers. These are very sensitive species and we need them because two thirds of the foods that we eat require pollinators. So Malila donates a portion of her proceeds to bee awareness and beekeeping and raising a whole legion of urban beekeepers. And I was so inspired by her model, so inspired by her example, that I started keeping bees. And I'm failing better as a beekeeper. And uh, (laughs) now my bees are doing really well. It's just, I'm really happy to work with them. And I've learned so much about my process and how I learned by doing something completely new. I knew absolutely nothing about beekeeping, but now I am an avid, very, very happy and joyful beekeeper. And I'll tell anybody to start keeping bees. (laughs) And you go back to your systems biologist background. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. They're an amazing species and we're learning more and more about bee communication and bee decision making. In fact, I'm reading a book right now called Honey Bee Democracy. Isn't that a great title? I love it. Evidently, bees make decisions. A recent research study shows that bees understand the concept of zero. That's like mind blowing to me. Wow. It's absolutely mind blowing. So I guess and I they're good to... leaders. And they're good leaders. Yeah, they don't just build consensus, they build unanimity. When they make a decision to leave the hive or to split or to swarm, it's everybody's in. <laughs> Everybody is all in. And they're working together for the good of the hive. Humans can learn so much by studying and observing the natural world and applying key learnings from the natural world to our experiences because we're part of the natural world. So kind of come full circle, Lily. (laughs) Yeah, so interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. Now, Sunny, if there were something you could change in education, what would that be? You know, I think it would be the reliance on the high stakes testing mania, which we seem to be enmeshed in right now. That to me has done a disservice to the profession. We put so much emphasis on one measure and put so much stress and anxiety because of a single measure. Now, there's some benefits to having a single measure is that there's a single dependent measure and we can now have a more reliable means of assessing impact of influences. However, there seems to be new research indicating that the reliance on high stakes, low value examinations is doing damage. It's doing psychological damage, it's doing damage to our system, it's doing damage to our kids. So I think if I could change one thing, it would be this. Instead of putting so much emphasis on a single one test that happens at one point, why don't we break it up and have pre and post assessments? Mm -hmm. Give students at the beginning of every class that they have, give them the final exam. Do a pre-assessment and see what children know, see what they've already mastered, and move towards a more mastery approach to education using pre- and post-assessment, and look for growth towards mastery, not just a single indicator of success. A lot of the research is, is showing that movement towards growth and assessing growth and mastery over a longer period of time allow students to fail better and build skills and confidence rather than a single indicator like a high stakes test. I call it high stakes, low value, because the value of that assessment in terms of students' reflection and metacognition and learning is very low because they get the results back months and months after the 
performance if they get it at all. So that's the one thing I would change is our reliance on a single measure of proficiency. Yeah, and having that pre and post assessment also helps mm-hmm. develop the teacher as well. Sure. So you know? we fail better. Yeah. All right. So if you were to go back in time, what advice would you give the younger you about leadership? I probably tell myself to believe in myself, you know, to trust my vision. Because I mean, I grew up uh, poor. I grew up, you know, English is my second language. So growing up in poverty, growing up as a Latino kid and a native Spanish speaker, you know, I had some strikes against me. And you know, I was told from my earliest teachers that there was something wrong with me. I wasn't as capable as my peers, and I believed it. So for the longest time, I believed in the low expectancy that was foisted upon me by my teachers. So if I could go back in time, I'd tell myself, believe in yourself, trust in yourself, believe in your vision, believe in your own capacity, and don't pay any attention to people who would project their own limited or low expectations on you. So I learned that lesson later in life, but I I wonder, you know, where would I be had I learned that lesson earlier? (laughs) But I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Uh, for that experience, because now I ensure that in my work with students and teachers in education, I ensure that I always bring high expectations to everybody that I encounter. Sonny, I wanted to touch on this a little bit, because I think this is really important. Can you speak a little bit about the importance of having mentors and coaches speak into your life as a leader? Absolutely. You know, there's a Zen saying that a teacher appears when the teacher is needed. (laughs) <laughs> and I had some absolutely gifted teachers and leaders that were mentors in my life that appeared exactly when I needed them. Again, I said I've been standing on the shoulders of giants. I include these teachers and these mentors and coaches as some of those giants. My seventh grade science teacher, Mr. Lang, my eighth grade science teacher, Mr. Higgins, these were just brilliant people who recognized something in me. In fact, Mr. Lang was also the wrestling coach, and I joined wrestling and became you know, a science geek early on. And then my first year as a teacher, I was a wrestling coach and a science teacher. So I'm kind of following in the footsteps of these people that really helped awaken in me a sense of my own capacity. Mm -hmm. And so that is a really essential part of leadership as a coach, as someone who can draw out that limitless potential that exists within us. And so I'm forever grateful for those teachers that uh, helped me see that potential that I didn't see myself. Right. And it's important for us to seek that out too, because we have this responsibility before us. We educate the world and we do need help. And, you know, you spoke about those limiting beliefs that we have. We don't see that. Other people can and can help us with that. So thank you so much. Now, Sunny, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? I can't state enough how important it is to engage in restorative practices. I'm working on several books at the moment, one on transcendent leadership and another one that I call Embracing a Mastery Mindset. So I'll leave folks with this thought. A corollary of the high stakes, low value testing that we have in our system, I think has established a minimum proficiency mindset among our students. And I think that's a dangerous mindset because it's a mindset that requires some external person to tell the learner or the worker what they need to do. I think we're building a sense of dependency rather than a sense of capacity. So what I would suggest is engage in restorative practices that improve your mindfulness and then embrace a mastery mindset. Constantly challenge yourself. Constantly step outside your comfort zone. Seek new challenges. Track and monitor your progress as you achieve those challenges. And once you accomplish something, celebrate success. That's oh, the I love that. <laughs> celebrate your success. If you take a challenging course and you're done and you complete it, celebrate your success. Those are the keys to mastery is to constantly challenging ourselves, set new mastery goals for ourselves. But make sure you track and monitor. Monitor your effort. Monitor your progress and how you feel about it. And then when you achieve a level of success, when you achieve a level of mastery, celebrate it because that's a necessary part that kind of acts as a slingshot for your next mastery goal. Love it. Sunny, thank you so much for adding value to me and to our listeners. It is absolutely a pleasure, Lily. Thank you very much for inviting me. So, so interesting. Have an amazing day, Sunny. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Hello, leaders. In closing, here's a quick message. 
Coaching is the art of influence that underpins leadership in the 21st century. It is the very thing that can get you from being stuck to being extraordinary. So go to masterleadership.org and sign up to get a free coaching session. Until next time, continue to ignite that leader in you.